The words that come out, out, of, out of our mouth uh, don't, have a good reflect, don't have a good reflection in our hearts sometimes. And it would seem that the words that come out of our mouth is like not pleasing to God. But I know that if we believe in Jesus, He already knows our shortcomings and calls us to rise, up, rise above them. If we repent and confess, He will forgive us when the words that come out of our mouth don't have a positive reflection of our hearts. He has washed us as white as snow. He also has given us opportunity each and every day for us to be a better example of Him. I pray that, I pray that if, we, if we follow God and truly listen to His word, He will forgive us. And if and that His praise will always be on our lips.
ഇന്ന് വന്ന കഷ്ടം ഇനി വരികയില്ല ഈ പാട് നമുക്ക് ചേർന്ന കരങ്ങളെ അടിച്ച് പാടി നമുക്ക് ദൈവത്തിൽ മുഖത്ത്
Jesus. Hallelujah. I ask the prayer team to come forward this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Where's the prayer team? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As Pastor said this morning. Hallelujah. We have men for the men's side and women for the women's side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah. If you have something that's weighing down on your heart, you've been burdened by it, and you don't want to tell it to anybody, just come into the presence of God and just say, I need something that I need prayer for. That's all you need to say. Hallelujah. He knows your heart. Hallelujah. You don't have to say anything to anybody. Just know that when, when God hears your prayer, there will be an answer for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He is good. He is good. Even when there is nothing good in any of us, He is good. He is waiting with open arms. Hallelujah. He is wanting you to run to Him, to His presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All you have to do is come just as you are. Hallelujah.
save. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As the prayer team is standing here, I just want to remind you, hallelujah, that he is mighty to save. He is mighty to heal. If you're going through something that you don't want to discuss with anybody, as far as you have something in your life that you just have some, some pain, some agony, hallelujah. If you have something that is going on that you don't want to discuss with anybody, hallelujah. If you have an illness or an ailment that you only yourself know, we haven't told anybody, hallelujah. I want you to come forward this morning time because God is here. His presence is here. Do you believe it? Do you believe that the presence of God is here today? Amen. Hallelujah. He is mighty to save. He is mighty to heal. He is more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Lift up your hands to the Lord this morning. Say, Lord, you are mighty to save. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord says, when you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that we have the privilege to worship you. A God who has conquered the grave, conquered over death, O oh Father, who is seated on the right hand of God the Father. You are mighty to save. You know our deepest need this morning. We thank you that you came down and you're still, Lord, working in our behalf. We thank you, Lord, for being a mighty God. Hallelujah. Father, thank you, Jesus for your goodness. Thank you. You are a God who is a very present help in the time of trouble. You are our friend indeed. And a friend indeed. You are our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer, our Keeper, our Shepherd, our Lord at the right hand, O oh Father. You are the one who leads us, Lord, every day of our life. Thank you, Father, for to you be the glory. I pray blessings upon your people. I pray that you break open the bread of life this morning. I pray that you feed us that we will go, Father, with a new Father, a vision in our life. I thank you, Father, for the tithe and offering that your people have given to the work of the Lord. I pray that you bless them, Father. This morning, thank you for accepting our worship this morning. Speak to us from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please take your seat and uh, I thank God for the goodness of God this morning. Um, I praise God for all that the Lord is doing. Uh, I would like you to sit in the presence of God for a few minutes because we don't have much time. And as we hear the word of God. As I get started, um, according to a story in the Reader's, that, uh, that was out in the Reader's Digest of, uh, a few years ago, there was a great emperor in India by the name of Shah Jahan. He was someone who is famous for building a beautiful structure in memory of his wife of 19 years, Mumtaz Mahal, who died bearing their 14th child. She died during the childbirth. When she died, Shah Jahan went to his wife's deathbed and after seeing her corpse lying there, it is said that he went back to his quarters. He shut the door and locked the door behind him. For three days, he remained in his room, did not eat or drink. When he reappeared nine days later to the people, they saw that his black hair has totally turned completely white. He was truly in mourning. And after returning to his palace, the emperor began to construct his wife's tomb on the banks of the river Jamuna. And as an easy view from his window, when he could see the, mesolo, uh, the, 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 the building, the mo monument that he wanted to create, he wanted to see from his window. They say that to build this mighty architectural feat, it took about 22,000 men and women, 22,000 men and women who worked day and night for 22 years. 22,000 men and women, they worked day and night for 22 years. It was a white marble tomb decorated with 28 different types, types of gems. A sheet of pearls was spread over the coffin. The doors of solid silver opened into the tomb and a solid gold railing surrounded the monument. Does anybody know what's the name of that building in India? It's the Taj Mahal. It's one of the wonders of the world. But do you know what? Shah Jahan, after creating and building that wonderful uh, the monument on, uh, for his wife, he wanted to build a mirror image for himself. But this he thought he would do it in black marble. Hers was white, he would do it in black marble. 
But do you know that that never happened? Because immediately after that, he was taken as a prisoner by his own son, whose name was Aurangzeb, who usurped the throne in 1658 uh, AD, and he was confined to his own palace, and he lived in his palace, staring out of that window, looking at the monument where his wife's body rested. It is said that at the age of 74, the guards, they opened the door one day, they found Shah Jahan dead, but his eyes were opened and his eyes did not close. He was opened. He died looking at the glitters of Taj Mahal that he could see from the window. A sad fate of a mighty king who wanted to build a monument for his beloved. I don't think any husband has done what this, this great king from India had done. It is not uncommon to build something for somebody that we love. We'll do something for someone that we love. And when we come to the Bible, we see a, ma a king by the name of David. You remember in the Psalms, he was writing, I love you, Lord, with all my heart. You are my rock, my salvation. You are my redeemer, my rock, my tower, my refuge. He used to sing songs of love. But do you know that this King David wanted to do something for God? And so, because he loved God, I mean, there was no other reason. David knew that he was a shepherd boy whom nobody cared about, even his father had forgotten to bring him to the meeting when prophet Samuel came. David knew he was a nobody, but God picked him up from the, from the back roads of the, of, the, of, the, of the land and he brought him and made him the king. And so I believe that one day he was sitting in his multi-million dollar palace and he was thinking about the God that he loved. And if you turn your Bibles, I want us to look into the passage and I want to speak to you a little bit about what the Lord has impressed in my heart. First Chronicles chapter 17. He sits in his throne. It's a beautiful time. He is now the king of Israel. And he looks at his beautiful palace and everything that he has done for himself. And then he says in verse number 1, 1 Samuel 17 verse number 1. It came to pass when David was dwelling in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under ten curtains. He was thinking about the house where God is residing. I am living in a beautiful palace of cedar wood and uh, gold and mahogany and all those wonderful things. But look where my Lord, my God is dwelling. He's still in a tent of curtains. And he tells that to Nathan the prophet. I don't want to read the whole passage here because that is not the intent. But Nathan uh, right then said, go, let do what is in your heart. But God said, no. I don't want you to build a house for me. All these years I have not lived in a place you don't have to but this one thing i will do i will allow your son who comes after you to build this house for me and god allowed so from the time that david knew that his son is going to build the house what david did was that till the end of his life he started planning to build this beautiful temple and making all the preparations for his son to build the temple. So I want you to flip uh, a few pages and come to First Chronicles chapter 29. We have come to a time when David is at the end of his life. He's about to die. And he's calling the people of Israel to all the people and he's giving them like a farewell address. You know, when somebody gives a farewell address, that words are very important. So he starts talking about his son Solomon. But... There are a few things I want you to pay attention. If you have a pen with you or maybe a small kind of a marker, I want you to underline a few things. I want to point out to you what David speaks to the people. Okay. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 29. He starts by saying, my son Solomon, 
whom God has chosen is young and inexperienced. But the work is great. What work? The work of building the temple is great. And then he says, because the temple is not for man, but the Lord God. Underline that. The temple is not for man. It is for the Lord God. It's not for me. It's not for man. Then verse number two. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might. This is what you should underline. I have prepared with all my might. What all he prepared you can look down. Gold, silver, bronze, uh, onyx stones, uh, gl glistening stones of different colors, precious stones, marble slabs. In abundance, he did everything. He made all the preparations. All the gathering together, he did everything for his son. Verse number three. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver. You see, the place that you need to think about is, I have set my affection on the house of my God. His Love, his affection for God is now said that he wants a beautiful structure for God. And he said, I have given my own special treasure of gold and silver. What all down below you see 3,000 talents of gold, of gold of Ophir, 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the walls of the house. The golds for the things of gold, the silver for silver, all kinds of work. And then King David is asking to the people of Israel, everybody who has assembled to hear his final validatory address to the people. He says, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? Whom of you are willing? I have done everything from my part. Who of you are willing to consecrate himself this day for the Lord. Then we see verse number 6, the leaders of the father's house, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and hundreds, and the officers over the king's world. Now this is the part I want you to underline. Offered willingly. They offered willingly. They did not say, oh David, you do it. You have all the wealth. Let me sit back and enjoy the worship of God. I will come to worship. You know, you do it because you are the king. No, it says they offered willingly. Verse number seven, they gave for the work of the house of the Lord. It says down below 5,000 talents, 10,000 uh, tarikas of gold, silver, bronze, iron. They gave everything. And verse number eight says, whoever had precious stones, they gave to the treasury. And verse number 9, this is where I want to stop here. The people rejoiced for they had offered willingly because with a loyal heart they offered willingly to the Lord and King David rejoiced greatly. This morning, I want for a few minutes for us to, I want to speak about a very specific topic called giving to build God's house. Giving to build God's house. Why we should give to build the house of God? The only one reason, there's no other reason, because you love God. You have been singing all this time. Lord, I love you, I love you. What The Lord says, okay, now what are you going to do for this? Are you going to do something from what you're saying you love me? And this is the point I want to speak to you today. So, just to give you a brief history of our church. In July 2001, you know, a group of um, uh, believers came together and the, the formed the first Asian Indian church here in Charlotte. In August of 2003, the church registered itself as Carolina's Christian Assembly. And God has blessed this humble beginning of a few families. For those who are from the very beginning, you have seen how God has enlarged and blessed our congregation. The Lord pulled us from Atlanta. We would never have come here, believe me. Has it not been for God, but God pulled us from there, leaving our family, my family behind. 
came back, came here because of a vision that God gave. That God is going to establish the work. And what has happened ever since is a good problem. We grew out of our facility. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing we could have done. There was no way all of us can sit in that place. The way the, the building structure is. From the last time, from the time that I've come to this place, we have been looking everywhere to buy a church property. We have been trying to get a place. We never found one so far. And so prayerfully, we put it on the board and, uh, and you all decided, let us do something. You know, we could not get the approval to build a sanctuary because of the lack of uh, parking space. So we decided to do the next best thing. We decided to renovate our building, uh, to break the walls from the inside and to create a beautiful structure. And we wanted to do it the best way possible. I'm telling you, whatever we have been doing so far, I can tell you for the glory of God, this has not been one person's decision. It's a group of collective decision. We all decided together. And it is a group effort that we have done in giving a word to a, a construction company that has started the work. But for that, it does not happen. Everything is good, but everything does not happen by air, just by praising and worshiping God. Because we need finances. And today, I want to bring it to, the, to launching our church fundraising activity. Today is a specific day. It's a special day and we prayerfully decided today is a day when we are going to launch our fundraising. And so that is the purpose of what I'm going to tell you is that the Lord expects every one of us to willingly, happily, cheerfully contribute to God's work that he has started in Charlotte. Because unless we all come together and work as one person, the work cannot be done. Now, you may ask me, Pastor, is fundraising scriptural? Does the Bible ever say that we need to raise funds to do this and that and I, I understand so I I was praying over it and I thought today my sermon would be to give you some uh, definite answers from God's Word why it is biblical and scriptural to raise funds from the people of God I'm going to speak about fundraising within the church I'm not going to be talking about the Old Testament we already looked at that the people offered and even though David had everything, but people offered willingly. They built a temple where everybody could come and pray to God. It was a common place of worship. And God said, that is my house. My house shall be a house for all people. Ende alien sagala bhumi India. It is not for one person. It is for all the people. A place for worship. A place that I meet with the people. But when we come to the New Testament, and I want to bring about that. I want us to understand where did this fundraising thing come? You know, when the Jerusalem church started, it started with a, uh, with a relief project. Because when we see the first instance of raising funds for in the early church is found in Acts chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, turn to that portion. Acts chapter 11, verses 29 and 30. It says that then the disciples, now we are talking about different churches. Not the Jerusalem church, but the different churches where Paul established all over Europe. It says, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. So they did, they sent it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul were the people who would collect the funds and they would bring it to the Jerusalem church. So why did Jerusalem church needed funds? Because it can be traced back to the time when the people who gathered there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost were people from every place all around the globe. They were pilgrims who came to celebrate. And when they started the church with 3,000 people who, who took water baptism and they joined the church, it says that they became the first congregation in Jerusalem. Now, when they accepted Christ, it brought a lot of shame for them. The other Jew, Jews, they rejected the Christians who came up. And so, what they did collectively, they were truly givers, the people of Jerusalem. If you turn to Acts chapter 2, it says that 
they sold everything that they had and they divided their portion together that nobody will be in want they helped each other and in uh, acts chapter 2 44 and 45 says all that they believed were together they were as one we are talking about the first century church they had all things common they sold their possession and the goods parted it so that every man had need they were able to supply that there was a love for each other there was a love for god that love rose above their individual aspirations individual needs and uh, that love and generosity sustained the church through a lot of period and we, we see that they passed for some time but then again the jerusalem church needed help so what apostle paul did was he made this church the focus of a, a church fundraising project and so paul writes to corinthians if you turn to first corinthians chapter 16 he gives some insight about how fundraising happened when he started communicating with different churches this apostle paul is writing to the believers in the city of corinth to help the church in jerusalem this is what he writes in first corinthians 16 now concerning the collection for the saints as i have given orders to the churches of galatia you must also do so paul had already given the same instruction to the churches in galatia now he's giving the instruction to the churches in corinth and this is what he says on the first day of the week let each one of you lay something aside storing as much as he may prosper that so that we don't take a collection when I come. Just part and keep some money aside. So that when I come, I don't have to do a fundraising. I will just pick up what you have raised and I will take to Jerusalem. That is what it means. Just collect among yourself every day. Bring some money and gather together and we will bless the church in Jerusalem. I want to give you some biblical principles of fundraising today. You know, it is a part of the biblical phenomena that we all help to build up the kingdom of God. The beautiful word out there is, it says, let everyone contribute. This is not meant for one or two persons. It's for everyone. Every believer has a responsibility to help. If you are somebody who is earning anything, you need to out of that help the kingdom of God. In fact, God even does not look at the amount that you give. The God looks at your willingness to give out of what you have. This is the principle of God's kingdom. Uh, the, the principle is not the amount, but your willingness to give out of what you have. Because if you are poor or not so rich, that does not also exempt you from giving to God's kingdom. A good example is in Mark chapter 12 verses 40 to 44 when Jesus saw a poor widow she put two coins it says mites into the treasury box and Jesus commended her for giving sacrificially for the work of God a poor widow who did not have any means no social security that is nothing she had but she gave out of what she had into the temple to for the work of the temple and Jesus commended her work so Paul answers the question how much should we give and this is the answer you should give as much as how God has prospered you it is relative to your situation nobody will dictate this and that but I'm telling you that it is something that you should give out of how God has given you you don't we are not to fix an amount for people to give you have to decide how much you want to give but you should give it out of a cheerful heart. You should give it willingly. Don't feel forced to do something that you want, don't want to do. But I'm telling you when you do that, God loves that person. Let me give you the verse. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each of us give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, not out of necessity. It says, but for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves the cheerful giver. I've never heard the word where I say God loves the 
person who lifts a hand and worship but the bible says god loves a cheerful giver somebody who is giving happily and uh, and and enjoying it to give to the work of god god loves it how many of you agree with me lift up your hands uh, and say thank you lord god loves me hallelujah god loves us hallelujah so it is uh, fitting for us to save in order to give so paul tells the corinthians to lay in store on a weekly basis so giving involves some planning it involves some sacrifice your personal wants should be put aside how does it become a sacrifice it becomes a sacrifice when you could have used that money to buy something that you want but not need something beyond you keep that money and you give it to the work of god that is called sacrificial giving that you reject your own wants take that money and give it to the work of god so this is what god is expecting from us is that we need to give what is valuable to god not what we have left over you know after fulfilling all our wants anything that is left over i give to god that is not the principle the principle that god puts it is that give what is valuable let it be sacrificial giving that god can use that to build his kingdom and this is the principle of giving so each person among you who are sitting on this pews you have a responsibility to to join together in the efforts that we are making and so in order to give for the glory of god and then paul says make a commitment and follow it to completion which means if you make a pledge make sure that you fulfill your pledge i remember a time back many years ago when one of my pastor my senior pastor he was very good with fundraising he got up in a uh, in a in a common uh, gathering and he said you know what let's all give give and he was like he's good good in good in that and he said give the biggest amount that you can put your name in it and sometime later they discovered a, a small uh, note with his name and somebody had put 3000 and the wonder that pastor's name who can kind have of made that announcement that is not the way don't think about what others can give it is about you because that is where you should write and give it for that this is a true incident i'm not joking here this truly happened somebody wrote his name because he is so passionate he said let him let me put for him 3000 and uh, you know so that let see understand this is out of cheerfulness it's out of a cheerful heart but second corinthians 8 11 says you must complete in doing it you know you whatever you plan to give to god complete it so let me very quickly give uh, a few characteristics of biblical giving number 1 it should be generous number 2 it should be, it should be voluntary second corinthians 9 6 and 7 i already said you know if you sow sparingly you reap sparingly if you sow bountifully you reap bountifully where paul is bringing the aspect of sowing a seed and reaping a harvest if you give little you will also receive little that is the law of nature in the kingdom of god if you sow sparingly you reap sparingly you sow bountifully you reap bountifully it should be a proportion number two is that our giving should be proportional to what you have please i am not advocating any time that you give beyond your ability i don't really recommend you giving money that you don't have or all that that i am not proposing that you have to give out of what god has blessed you with it also giving gives accountability the church the leadership the board is accountable for every penny in fact we think we talk among ourselves and we make sure that every penny is spent wisely we don't spend money frivolously and so there are certain things that we are going to tighten our belt in the coming days we are not going to spending any money unnecessarily where we can avoid that's the plan because we want this is the priority right now and also our giving should be motivated by love not by anything else because it should be a love for god is going to be a love for other people imagine a house to worship a place to attract people who are from the outside you prepare a way for them you know i don't expect to be the pastor of this church forever i don't i'm very realistic i have a time where god has put me here but i believe the time is for us to build 
a place where people can come together to worship the Lord. Amen. And we all need to get together in this venture and do what God says. And 2 Corinthians 8 24 says, Show to other people, to other churches, the proof of your love so that I can boast about you to other places. Paul is telling, I can boast about your generosity on what you give. Also, let me tell you that true biblical giving reflects the condition of your heart. You know, when you truly love God, you will truly give to the things that, that you mean what you say. Uh, and uh, it should not be lip service. Many times, our worship is just lip service. God knows. We also know that nothing goes beyond. Just coming, worshipping, going back, but nothing reality. In fact, when it hits the purse, at least for men I know, that is a, that is a, that is a very, very touchy point. When you hit the wallet, that is where the true love comes. Because you, think, you spend things on that you love. I know somebody who buys the, the latest uh, iPhone. When it comes, he pays like thousand dollars and but there he is in great debt because he loves to um, use his new phone and use that. You know, you are buying everything that you love. But let me ask you this. Do you truly love? Because that is how you profess in giving to God. Uh, a mother wanted to teach her daughter a moral lesson. So she gave a, a, a girl a quarter and also a dollar bill to take to church. And uh, she told the girl, put whatever you want in one, whatever you want in the collection plate, put, keep the other for yourself. I mean, you decide. Told the little girl, you decide. You have a quarter, you have a dollar bill. Whatever you think in your heart, you put in the collection plate. And that's what she sent, uh, she told the daughter. So when they were coming out of the church after the service, the mother asked the daughter, how much did you give? Did you give the quarter? Or did you give the, the dollar? And the, the little girl said, well, I was going to give the dollar. But before the collection, the man at the pulpit said, we should be cheerful givers. I know I would be more cheerful when I give the quarter and keep the dollar for myself. You know, that is one way of doing it. You know, people misinterpret and say, oh, I'll be happy when I don't give nothing, you know. I can use it. No, no, no. We have to cheerfully give to the work of God. And I will also tell you that... Uh, that biblical giving demands great faith. You know, it is faith in the, in, the, in the work of God. When we trust that God is going to provide your needs, you will open up and give. When you trust God, He will help you with, when you, when you put your money where your mouth is and give the things to the kingdom of God. I'm going to come to the close right now. You know, our giving should bring us joy. You know, the end of the story that we read before, uh, in, in the case of David, it brought great joy to the people when they gave to the work of God. Amen? Amen? It brought joy. So why should we give to build the house of God? Let me give you three reasons. Very quickly and I'm going to close here. From First Chronicles 29. Verse number 1 to 5 it says, Because God deserves the very best. Why you should give? Because He deserves the very best. Not the worst, but the very best that you have. Number 2, verses 6 to 9. Because it is a joy and a privilege to give to the Lord. You know, one time you remember the, uh, they tested Jesus, they brought, he said, right to pay taxes to Caesar. And I remember Jesus took a coin and he showed to the people and said, give to Caesar that belongs to Caesar and give to God that belongs to God. We all gave to Caesar here. I know you all filed your income tax returns. You all, to the last penny you have given to the government, the taxes that the government owned. But I'm going to ask you, did you give to God what is due for him? If you are keeping back, let me tell you that that's going to restrict God's blessings upon your life. Give to God what belongs to God. In fact, what belongs to God? Everything. Everything belongs to God. So we give to God out of our cheerful heart back to the Lord. Number, number third is, I would say, verses 10 to 16. Because whatever we have comes from God and belongs to Him. You know, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. I will tell you for a surety that God is building His church here in Charlotte, and He is going to build it one way or the other. This church is going to God is going to raise up a group of people who is going to reach out to unreached people in this place, and uh, I, I would invite you to be a part of it, brothers and sisters. You know, Jesus is uh, building His church through CCA. This church is going to march like a mighty army. Jesus is building his church through CCA. It's going to be like water in a dry and barren land. 
God, Jesus is building his church through CCA. It's going to rise like a valley of dry bones. With my eyes of faith, I can see many people coming to the Lord, accepting Christ, taking water baptism, joining the church, being a vibrant community among the Asian Indians in Charlotte. This is my dream. And I've been dreaming from the time I've come here. And today I'm telling you for a surety, God, Jesus is building his church here in Charlotte. And he is wanting to do it through each of you. If you are willing to do what God wants from us. Can you join him in this task right now? At this time I invite the, our church board members. They are going to come around you. And as, uh, as we hear some music. As Emily is going to play some music. I want to invite our, our church board members. Can you, uh, can you just go. You are going to receive a pledge form. Our plan is to raise $100,000. This is our budget that we want to raise a hundred thousand dollars from our church. You know the money is there. The only thing is that the money is in your pockets. It's not in the in the treasury of the church. The money is there. I want you to think for a moment, and uh, we are going to I just can 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 the board members stand up, please? Can you go ahead and uh, distribute to everyone? I've told that this this form, this is for you. You don't have to fill it right now, but I want you to take this form with you, husband and wife. Maybe you can pray over it. You can decide. You don't have to write anything right now. But I want you to take this pledge form. As a church, we want you to be a part of this great work that God has started here. You know, he who has begun a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, take this pledge form. Prayerfully decide what you want to do. This is your chance to show God that you want to be a part of God's house of worship to build a house i pray that you complete the form the pledge form that god will favor you with multiplied blessings i also told you if there is any young people who are earning money i know some of you are cutting lawns babysitting i know some of you i won't tell you the names give out of what you have it doesn't matter if it's a one dollar a ten dollar a thousand or fifty thousand whatever give out of what you have out of what God has given you. I want you to pray over this this week, brothers and sisters. We want to launch this. And I will tell you one thing. I know many of you, some of you at least have invested in many stocks and shares. And your stock value has fallen down. You look at your 401k, it is coming down. I will tell you one investment that will never come down. I'll tell you that if you give it to God, God will return to you multiplied blessings. From my end as your pastor, once we get the forms, I am going to pray to the Lord that God is going to bless you abundantly in tangible ways. I don't know if you're going to get in money, but in some way you know that God has blessed you as a result of you giving out from what you have. I am promising this, that this pledges will be gathered together. It is going to be with me and I am going to pray over them. I am going to pray over each pledge form for you that God is going to repay you, multiplied blessings over you. That you, when you give to the Lord, God is not a debtor, but He is going to give beyond what you ask or think. Can you just stand up on our feet? I want to just surrender our hearts to the Lord today and say, Lord, all that I have is all that you have given me. I want to surrender it before you. I pray over this, Lord. Help me to decide the best that I can give for the glory of God. Let's close our eyes and look to the Lord in prayer. As we sing this final chorus, then we are going to close here. The song says, All to Jesus, I surrender. Do you mean what you sing? Hallelujah. All to Jesus, I surrender.
Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege to join hands, put our hand on the plow, and work for your kingdom. For such a time as this, you have brought us to this place here in Charlotte. We were somewhere in India, long forgotten, but you brought us, you gave us a job, you gave us blessings beyond our wildest imagination. Places we were not worthy, Lord, you opened up. You opened up doors. Your favor was upon us. I pray, Lord, that you help your people to realize how much we depend on you. I pray for your divine favor upon us. Help us to give willingly, cheerfully, generously to the work of the Lord. Let this be a start of a mighty move of God. Father, especially our target is the, the multiplied thousands of Hindus who are here, Lord, from India. And we want to reach them with the gospel. Father, you know, Father, this is our heart's desire. And Lord, you're going to do something amazing. I pray that you continue to speak to your people. Lord, and I pray that you continue to deal with their hearts that they will give sacrificially and generously for the work of your kingdom. Father, I surrender myself for this cause. Thank you for the amazing vision that you have given us. We want to rally around the vision and move forward with all that we have so that your name will be glorified. Father, I pray for your people as they leave this place and go to their homes. Some of them are traveling, Lord, overseas. I pray that you be with them. Bless us all, Father, Lord. And if it is you, will bring us back to glorify your name. Thank you for everything. We give you the honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for a minute. I request Prasad Brother to come and say the announcements. Thank you.